Measurement tools are just part of the biomed job, and yet a lot of people either don't have the correct tool for the job or they don't know how to use the tool that they have in their possession. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of the irregular measurement tools that we use in our career field. Coming up next, right here on Better Biomed. guys welcome back to better biomed today i per request am going to do a video about the various different types of measurement tools that we use in our career field and just to let you know some people they just don't believe me that these tools are something that we should have in our position and you know furthermore a lot of people just don't know how to use them correctly so let's go ahead and let's take a look at some of the stuff that we use in our career field and why you might want one of these in your toolkit so let's go ahead and start all the way over here to the side. This is a level. And as you can see, this is a level that can be oriented in a couple different configurations. We can do angles. We can do horizontal over a long span. We can do vertical. And it's magnetic. So this guy right here luckily can be attached to beams. I usually set it on top of things when I'm trying to level them out. Uh, especially if they're metal, it works out quite nicely, so you don't have to worry about it falling and hitting you on the head. A level is something that you should have probably in your larger toolkit. Now, I, I do talk about toolkits often, and your smaller toolkit is the one that you'll take around with you, you know, when you're going on the day to day jobs. Your larger toolkit is usually something that you keep back at the shop, and if you have a large project, that's when you're going to involve your large toolkit. Levels are a type of tool that you don't really need it until you need it. And trust me, the last thing you wanna do is hang something permanently on a wall and notice that it's slightly off cant. Because if it is, maybe you won't notice it. Maybe it's a little detail, but more than likely, one of those anal retentive doctors, they're gonna see it and they're gonna know that it's not level. Guys, get a level, they're inexpensive. The next item up is going to be your tape measure. And you would think that a tape measure, a tape measure, right? Well, mine have had kind of a rough life. That's because I use the heck out of my tape measures and they have a bunch of features on them, which I absolutely love. So one of the main features that I want to talk about is the fact that some of them have built-in retention. I'm not locking anything, you see that? I love that feature. I absolutely love that feature. Because often when you are measuring something, it's just you. And if it's just you, then getting it down to the end of this table, let's see, let's take a measurement end of this table, and right there, 58 inches, four foot, 10 feet, four foot, 10 inches. So it's much easier if it's got that auto retention mechanism. One of the most durable tape measures on the market, the Stanley Fat Max, you can see it does not have that feature. And that is so annoying. It's a strong, durable tape measure, but ah, it's just very, very, very annoying. So some of the other features that you'll see, almost all of these are about the same. So I have some sort of real indicator per feet. So you can see that that's one foot, two foot. Also notice how the 16 is in red. The 16 is in red because that is indicating your 16 on center for your studs. So if I were to measure from right here to, yep, right about there. So you can see from one screw to the next screw in my wall, that is 16 inches. So the center of your stud to the center of your stud. Notice how this tape measure has got a dual head. So you can either put it this way or this way. So I can either latch it on the top of a beam or something, or I can latch it on the bottom. That's a good feature. I do dig that. So you see the T right there. Tape measures, they're not all the same. This one here has small fractionals right there. Now, guys, I do love me some metrics. I really do versus fractional standard. But, you know, we, we do with what we got. And all I can say is it's nice to have those fractionals, especially if you're making repeat cuts of something. Um, that it's very, very exact. 
Notice on the back of this one, it's got some additional information. That's usually for construction given. But take a look over here. We got decimal equivalents, sixteenths, thirty seconds. Now that's pretty useful, especially when dealing with drill bits. So if you have a 0.218 drill bit, you know that it's 730 seconds. And we'll get to that later when you are working with decimal and converting over to fractional. Um, it's nice to have that feature. So this is a pretty good tape measure right here. This is the Chameleon self lock. And uh, notice how bright it is. I really dig that. Cool. So that's the tape measure. These are 25 foot, often uh, the ones that are in my tool kit, especially my tool bag. Um, that is a 10 or 12 foot. So I do keep a tape measure in my tool bag. I use it quite frequently. Um, there's many, many uses for tape measures. It's not just for making cuts of something. You can uh, measure when something's got slop. So if, if you've got a reasonable amount of slop or if something was supposed to be installed like 10 inches of clearance from a wall, you can whip out that tape measure and say, nope, doesn't have 10 inches of clearance. And that's why your, you know, your ventilation on your freezer is messing up. Um, it's very, very handy to have a tape measure. And if I'm documenting something, I'll whip out the tape measure, take a photo with my phone, bam, I've got a record. That's tape measures. The next thing, tape measures are okay. They are reasonably accurate. And the way that I say reasonably is because it's fine when you're taking longer measurements. Um, many tape measures have a head which weevil wobbles a little bit. And because the head weevil wobbles, what people will often do is they will take from the one inch mark and they will basically erase everything from the one inch mark and then proceed to count up. So in other words, what they would do with a tape measure is if something is 10 inches, what they would do is they would start at the one and they would go to 11 and what they would do is they just remember to remove an inch so that way there you you don't have to deal with this weeble wobble head because that can leave easily a couple hundredths of an inch and that could make quite the difference especially if you're doing repeat cuts so what do you do if you need something to be absolutely precise or if you need a straight edge straight edges are so useful in our career field and because of that we have these machinist rulers and it's called a machinist ruler because it is very, very specific. Right here, you can see it's one inch, it's, it's four, eight, 12, 16, 20, 24, 28, one, that's in 30 seconds. And the very top of this one here is in 64. So that's even smaller. Um, but take a look at the back. It's larger division. So I've got 16th and I've got eighths. Very cool. So this is a machinist ruler. We use it for uh, straight edge if you're aligning two things. Um, if you need precision measurements, let's say for tolerances, this guy is not normally going to be out of calibration. So if you have one of these in your tool set, and let's say you need to leave half an inch of clearance on something, um, this is the tool that I would use. I would never use a tape measure for half inch clearance. They're not really that specific. I mean, it's close enough. Um, it, for most of the stuff we do, it'll, it'll get you where you need to go. Just remember not to use from the end point. Now on a machinist ruler, you can use them from the end point because it's precision machine from the end to your first uh, deviation, which would be you know your 16th, your eighth, your 32nd, whatever it is. So um, that is a machinist ruler and they're often stainless steel. Wonderful products. If you are making a line on something, I would use these as my straight edge. And because of that, you see how this one here for extra traction, it's got cork on the back. This is a longer version of the same ruler. It's less durable. Like you can see this guy flopping around a little bit. So this one here is my primary. I love it. Take care of your tools. I do put a light grade of oil on these. Um, that way they don't develop any surface rust. Um, this one's made in Japan, and this one here is made in China. Also, man, you want to talk about quality of measurement tools. Made in Japan, I want you to know that it is absolutely accurate measured from the end to any of these other deviations. I can prove that with these tools over here. Now, take a look at the Chinese ruler. This is something to be aware of. See the first line right here? 
Notice how it's not from the edge. I do not like that. Unfortunately, that you have to start at the, the point, which you can see it's a rounded over corner. So it's not as precise. And sometimes with this ruler here, I have to do the one inch trick. So you start at the one inch, count your way over. And I use this ruler here when I was calibrating CNC machines because um, you know 18 inches gives me a lot of calibration resolution, all right? So uh, machinist ruler, stainless steel, I get them on Amazon, awesome tools. I recommend you get one. You might not need it until the day you really need it. All right, the next tool. The next tool is actually a pretty useful little guy. We have used these guys in wood shops for a long, long time, but this tool is a digital angle gauge. And a digital angle gauge, you might not think, why would I ever use that? Certain, certain areas of our career field, you are going to have to maintain a very particular angle when you're doing certain calibrations, whether it be optics, whether it be x-ray, etc. A digital angle gauge and you can see mine is throwing a bunch of errors and stuff i think it even has a low battery very very high resolution so it's in 0.1 of a degree and that is very very specific so if i need to calibrate something to 45 degrees um, first what you do is you put it on a reference surface then you hit zero and then you go ahead it does have magnets inside it and with the magnets you know, I will put it on the metal surface of whatever it is, whether it be a saw blade or whatever, and then you set it manually to your 45 degrees, bam, and then you lock it down, right? And you set your calibration. So that is a digital angle gauge, and it's a very simple device, very easy to operate. Highly, highly recommend getting one of these. I use this guy all the time, well, especially when I'm cutting wood but uh, you can use it for various other things as well. Very cool tool. One of the biggest ones that I think that almost every biomed should have are these two guys right here. Now these are two very similar versions of the same tool. These are called calipers and these are not vernier calipers. These uh, have regular inch in and millimeter uh, deviations down them, but these are so useful. Calipers, I, I can't believe I walk into shops and I see that they don't have calipers. One of the most useful things for calipers is figuring out fasteners that you're really not sure what they are. Now, I've got three of these leveling feet here, and especially with medical equipment, you never know if it's gonna be standard or metric. So what we can do is we can use this guy right here, or we can use one of these tools over here. I'll get to that in a minute. but. If you need to figure out how big something is, let's take this little guy right here. Now, uh, just by looking at this, it's pretty small. I'm guessing it's like an M4. So we can go ahead and put this guy close. All right, lock it down with the screw. All right, and then it's 0.231 inches, All right? And then we hit this guy right here. It says 5.88 millimeters. If you look at 0.231, let's go back to this guy right here, 0.231 and 0.231. So you can see right here, this is the decimal equivalent. You got the decimal number down here and the fractional equivalent, 0.231. And it's really close to 730 seconds, but it's not. Uh, if it was a 730 seconds, it would be a little bit different. And let's go ahead and verify that with our next tool. This right here is called a thread pitch gauge, okay? And this one here, you can see it's engraved and it says metric. So if this is truly metric, then your thread pitch gauge will match up. So with a thread pitch gauge, you have these combs and they are various degrees, you can see right there, and they have little numbers that are engraved in them. Those numbers are gonna be your thread pitch. Now, as you get used to fasteners, you'll learn that metric have certain thread pitch that's why i can go almost directly to the comb that it's probably going to be Let's see 0.125 new new 1.0 oh my gosh that's beautiful so let's go ahead and take a look 1.0 take a look at x 
comb matches up beautifully and that's how you use these now if you line this guy up it looks kind of like that nope it's not lining up so let's go to the SAE so SAE is American Standard it's fractional and its thread pitch has got it's the amount of points per inch on SAE so the more points like this one right here is 18 and we go up one let's see 19 points per inch so that's your pitch All right so it's a pitch gauge and what we're gonna do is we're gonna line the comb up and eh, nah, it wants to kind of line up but 24 here let's go ahead and let's show you guys 24 kind of wants to line up but you can see that some of the teeth are not engaging so if you are really close to lining up your thread pitch but it doesn't match go ahead and change to a different standard and I switch over to metric 1.0 thread pitch BAM here we go so that's called a thread pitch gauge very handy they fold up very compact just like that so two of these in a toolkit super easy they usually come in tap and die sets do not lose your thread pitch gauge those things are absolutely fantastic let's go ahead and let's figure out this guy all right let's zero it with the caliper come in on the teeth i got 0.369 or 0.7 Ooh, that's 9.38 millimeters uh this guy looks like it might be metric so that would be an M10, um, but let's go ahead and check it. Again, I have no idea what these guys are. I just have enough experience with fasteners that I can probably come pretty close. So um, let's see, 1.5. Ooh, that's close. That's really close. 1.75. Hmm. What do you think? 1.75. Nope. Let's go finer. 1.25, definitely not. Too fine. Man, 1.5 really looks, really looks close, but it's it's not really lining up. So let's switch over to SAE. With SAE, it was 0.37 of an inch. Let's go back to our fractional. I actually have a chart which I normally do this. Um, 0 0.37, 0 0.375 is three eighths of an inch. That, I bet you, is a 3 eighths of an inch fastener. I thought it was uh, M10, but let's go ahead and verify it. Let's get the SAE thread pitch gauge, and let's see. Let's start with 18. So 18 threads per inch, and take a look right there. No way, Jose. Close. No way. So let's go over to the coarse thread. So... Remember on thread, there's always fine and then there's coarse. They kind of have them separated out one side or the other. Uh, let's go 16. Oh, man, that's beautiful. That is absolutely beautiful. So this is 3 eighths by 16. See that? The comb fits out. It's not lifted up. The teeth are engaging perfectly. And it says right there on the front. This is 16. So it's 3 eighths by 16. Up until a moment ago, I had no clue what this guy was. I just pulled it out of a drawer. So that is a 3 8 by 16. Now, take a look at this guy. I have no idea what this guy came off of. So same thing. We're going to go ahead and zero it out. Let's measure outer diameter, 0 0.386. 0 0.386. Ooh. 0 0.386, 3 8 Nope. It's close. 0.386. No, I'm not seeing it. So let's go ahead and switch over to metric. Oh, 9.8. So this one might actually be a 10 millimeter. So let's go ahead and switch over to the metric. Let's start with the coarse thread because that is obviously a coarse thread. And let's see, let's go to 1.75. It's really close. It's really close. Let's try 1.5. Oh, beautiful. 
absolutely beautiful. So here you go. Take a look at that engagement. Perfect. So there we go. M10 by 1.5. Perfect. So that's how you would use thread pitch gauges with your caliper to determine a fastener size. And once you know the fastener size, then you can find, you know, matching hardware. Very cool. So there it is. I just sized all three of these leveling feet. I had no clue how big they were. And I did all that because of a caliper and a thread pitch gauge. Very cool. All right, let's go ahead and set those off to the side. And let's get to the last one. This guy over here. So this one right here is a dial gauge. Um, there's analog dial gauges and there are digital ones, right? They come in different resolutions, which the resolution is almost always inscribed on them. And they have some really cool features on all of them. So anyway, this one here is a digital gauge. I'm going to turn it on. You can see this resolution right there is four digits. And the way that these guys work is uh, you use them for testing, let's say, slop. So if something is got a lot of play, so let's say you have linear motion, which means a rail and something's bolted to the rail. You put this guy on there and it's got that much play. Not good, guys. So this guy here is called a dial indicator. And dial indicators come in analog, they come in digital. Here you can see analog. This one here is a digital. Um, they operate really close to the same and yet very different. I love myself some digital. Some guys prefer analog because it shows them, you know, a better picture, especially if you're determining how far out of spec something is. But uh, I use this guy right here for calibrating CNC's all the time. Very, very precise and always keep your original container because these guys are precision instruments and you don't want them just floating around in a tool drawer. You want to keep them clean and you want to make sure that they're not getting bent and beat up. So this guy right here, it works by putting pressure down at one end and once you do it and you get to a stable condition you then zero it and then you can either move this down linear motion and it will it'll fluctuate like this which will show you how far out of spec something is um, or you can tell it how far something moves so if I set it here and then uh, I moved my item half an inch boop. Let's say it moves 0.469. If it moved 0.469, it didn't move a half an inch. Something is a little bit out of spec. So it's a precision instrument. It's fastened by the back to usually a stand of some sort. Let's go ahead and put that guy back in its box. And this here right here is a magnetic base. And you can turn the magnet on and off. And you can level it out using these fasteners up here. And the dial indicator will connect right here, right? So this threads through the nipple on the back and you are good to go. And this stand is sturdy, uh, except it's not really screwed down. Before I use it, I definitely have to remember to tighten that bad boy down. But uh, very cool, there's all different types of mounting hardware for dial indicators. Just make sure that when you do set up a precision measurement instrument like that, that everything is tight before you start your measurements. And here is an analog version of the same thing. Now this one here is, uh, this is a trimming gauge for uh, spindles, for CNC machines. And this will mount in the spindle and then you rotate it and you see how far out of spec each of these dial indicators are. But it's still a perfect example of an analog set because this one here operates the same way. It's very precise. You can see the needle moving. It does go back to zero, but look at this. It's analog, so you can actually turn the dial face to zero your gauge. So if it's not quite sitting at zero, for whatever reason, you can turn this guy just a little bit, bam, it's at zero. Very cool. So notice also it's got rings right here and right here. These little pointers, you can turn this guy and set for how far you want something to move. So let's go ahead and zero it. Uh, let's see, my spec is from 10, right? 
So I'm looking for 10 to 40, okay? So if, if I'm looking for 10 to 40 thousandths, then I set these little points right here, they move around the dial, and that is my pass fail. So if this guy maintains this revolution right here when I'm doing my measurement, it's in the pass fail. If it goes past this little guy right here, I know it's a fail indication and the part has to be rejected. Now, these analog type of gauges, they're used for really precise things when you're calibrating some imaging equipment and stuff. But this guy here is mainly designed for CNC. I just pulled it out because it's got two analog dial indicators. How cool is that? And they actually come with this little calibration piece. So when I'm setting it up, you zero it according to the surface, and then you put that little piece in between the dial indicator and your work surface, and it should read a very specific number. Very cool. So those are dial indicators. We got thread pitch gauges. We have <laughs> digital calipers. We've got digital angle gauges. We've got machinist rulers, various types. We've got measuring tapes. There's obviously different types of measuring tapes. And we've got levels. All of these tools right here are measurement tools that Biomeds can absolutely use. And some of them I use all the time, especially when I'm trying to find fasteners or something. But guys, if you don't know how to use these, let me know. I will actually show you real world examples for each and every one of these if I need to. And that way there, everybody's on the same page. But you should know how to use precision instruments. The number one thing that I have to tell you guys is to make sure that they're being maintained. All measurement instruments are susceptible to breakages and rough handling, so make sure that measurement instruments are always maintained in their container. So don't leave things hanging out. Put things away if they come with a case. Absolutely. Put them away. And if you're going to hold them for a long, long period of time, maybe take the batteries out. Because batteries, especially in some of these Chinese versions, they just, it tends to seep the batteries. And a lot of these devices rely on coin cells, right? And I keep extra coin cells in each and every one of my precision measurements. And the cool thing about analog is that the analog ones require nothing. You just gotta show them a little bit of love, keep them in a cool, dry place, maintain your equipment. Anyway, guys, that's enough for that measurement instruments. I have a lot of them and I use them. I use them all the time. So thanks for watching guys.